Yeah, so the sequence of returns risk, it's something that's going to amplify investment volatility. And it's just this idea that if I'm spending from my assets and the market is down, I'm going to have to sell some principal to meet my spending goal or sell off more shares to, to meet my spending goal. And then that money's now gone. So even if the overall market recovers at that point, my portfolio is not going to recover. This is Better Wealth with Caleb Williams. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Better Wealth Podcast. In most episodes that I interview people, we just jump right in, and I do a pretty good job just giving context. And I had the the honor and pleasure of interviewing Dr. Wade Fowle, who is like the guy, is the guy as it relates to retirement, income, distribution strategies. And I've wanted to have him on my show for a while. Finally got him, and we dove deep deep into retirement strategies. We talked about, you know, problems facing retirement. We talked about sequence risk loss. We talked about safe withdrawal risk. We talked about annuities. We talked about life insurance. We talked about reverse mortgages. We talked about pension optimization strategies, buffer strategies, re- different retirement options. He he really is really really well researched. And it's one of those things where if you're if you know the industry, you've definitely heard of him or if you're a nerd that's like reads a ton of journals, you probably read a lot of his journals that he's written. Um so I'm going to do my best to uh, summarize some of his some of his bio, and the reason I'm giving sharing this with you is I want you to listen, hear what he's saying because I'll, I'll say this: he's not coming in as like a life insurance lover, but in his research, he realized that when life insurance is set up and used properly, it literally unlocks so many things, creates a buffer asset, unlocks different annuity or pension strategies, and it just the words that he uses um, are not necessarily the same words I use, but it's just well researched. And so it's powerful. And he also gives other alternatives. And I just, out of all the interviews that I've done, this one was definitely like the, the deepest as it relates to certain um, topics. And I don't talk a lot about retirement income, but it's very, very important um, that we, that everything that we do with our money, we have the end in mind. So here we go. Dr. Wade Fowle has a ton of designations. Um, he also is the program director of the retirement income certified professional designation. So essentially anybody that is is going to be an expert in this, he's a program director of that whole program. He's also a professor of the retirement income at American College. Um, he holds a doctorate in economics from Princeton Un- University and has published more than 60 peer-reviewed research articles. Um, and, and he also hosts a retirement researcher website, and he's a contributor for Forbes, advisor perspective, uh, the Journal of Financial Planning, and he's an expert panelist for the Wall Street Journal. He's the author of a couple books. I would highly, highly encourage you to support what he's doing by going to his website, go buy his books. Um, but without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Wade Fowle. Dr. Wade Fowle, welcome to the show. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me here. I, I'm a nerd. I was just talking to someone right before we got on the, sh- on, on this podcast together. And we were talking all about like inspirational things about money. And I was like, I could not stop talking about the time <laughs> that we're going to have, because I'm like, there's this guy and he's like the expert of expert about retirement distribution. And she's like, what? Like, what does that <laughs> even mean? And so my, my hope is number one, thank you so much for being on here. I, I want to really talk about, number one, your backstory, because you're brilliant and all, you've accomplished more right now than most people have ever like, could even think about accomplishing over their lifetime. And, so, and I also want to talk about like, the, what is going on in our world right now. There's so much uncertainty. There's so many problems. I, I know people hear that from me, but I, I would love to hear that like, from you, from a researcher, um, a person that has their doctorate and, and, and some pretty technical things as it relates to retirement planning, and then get into a, a lot of potential solutions and, and what you write about. And so, uh, again, thank you so much for being on the show. Okay. Well, it sounds like a good agenda. So, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm fascinated about people's backstory. And so, how in the world did you get into this? Why was it one of those things where you were in college and you were just like, ah, I'll pick this, and then you, you went down a rabbit hole? Or did you, or did you come out of the womb like, I want to dedicate my life in that? Like, what, what is your backstory? I've heard a lot of interviews. I've done a lot of research on you. And I don't think you talk a lot about your backstory pre, you know, getting started. So, I, I'm always curious to hear a little bit about that. Well, by the time I got through high school, I was quite interested in economics and and pretty much had a good idea. That's what I wanted to do. 
I was just hoping to be a U.S. government economist. And that was the direction I was going. But then at the last minute, I started just thinking it'd be nice to try being a professor. It's a lot easier to move from academics into government than in the other direction. And then also, I just thought I'd like to experience living in another country. And so instead of heading right away to Washington, D.C., I, I went to Tokyo, Japan, and I spent 10 years as an economics professor there. But then wanting to come back to the U.S., I, I was mostly focused on pension systems and emerging market and developing market countries, and that's not so useful in the, to find a job in the U.S. So that's where I always had an interest in personal finance and, and learning how to invest in that sort of thing. And I just sort of stumbled into doing research on retirement income. I, I was studying for the CFA exam, which is for like financial analysts as a part of trying to make myself marketable to come back to the US. I stumbled across this idea of the 4% rule of thumb for retirement spending and didn't know what to make of it. But I, in, in the process of doing other research, I had this data set that had 20 different countries data going back to 1900. And I was just curious about how did that 4% rule idea that was applied in the United States, how would that have worked with other countries' data? And the, the results were not all that optimistic. And that was really then the foundation for, in doing that research, there was, there was a lot of interest in it. And usually academic economists, unless they're like super famous Nobel laureate type people, nobody really reads their research. But then suddenly people were reading <laughs> what I was writing. And so... That also got me excited that this is a hot new field and personal finance really is a new field. It was just in 2000 that I think the first PhD program in, in personal financial planning was created. So I made the transition over to financial planning and retirement income planning and never really looked back at that point. When, would, when did, you first, did you write your first article as a, or did you started your research on the 4% rule? What year was that? It was actually, I was just getting the notifications on LinkedIn. <laughs> so 10 years ago in, in wow. September, 2010, I, I wrote the article and, and started a blog and, and posted about the article. And then it was published in December, 2010 in the Journal of Financial Planning. So but yeah, it was exactly 10 years ago. <laughs> if, you're, if you're listening to this, it's very common that financial planning, a lot of people focus on strategies and there a lot of times we want to like increase our money. And so there's things like dollar cost averaging, you can max out different, you know, 401k plans. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, people talking about strategies, but is it not true that very few people, especially in 2010, were talking about, okay, great, how are you going to best spend that money in the future? Like mm -hmm. that, that's what, that was kind of crazy to me is like, um, and I'm, I'm obviously, I'm, I haven't been in this business that long, but I, I was grateful to learn from people um, that taught me to think with the end in mind. And I've just found a lot of times as we, we've seen hundreds of people's plans that there's no strategy. There's even, there's not really a thought to what they're going to do when they, hit the uh, retirement is a bad word around here, by the way, too, but it's we, we use it. Um, but it's like, what, what do you even do when you hit that? Is that is that the epiphany that you had? Or is it just like, there's just not a lot of research on something that's like, a, effectively gonna affect every single person? Right, not a lot of research, and just a lot of rules of thumb, and a lot of thinking that nothing really changes at retirement, that the yeah. same sort of investment approach you take pre retirement, you can just continue to use post retirement, the only difference is now you're taking distributions as well and trying to fund spending from your assets that you've saved. But that ends up being a huge difference. And that's what makes retirement income so different and why you can't just apply the same sort of tools and models to the retirement income problem. Right. So the, the rules have, have changed a little bit as it relates to income versus investing or saving for the future. One of the things that I, I, I'm doing is I'm, I'm actually in the process of doing research on like the problems that people are experiencing. In other words, I, I want to know why people are broke <laughs> or why they're failing financially. Um, from a researcher, the time that we're recording this, it's in probably the craziest year of a lot of people's lives. Um, what If you had to summarize like some of the problems that we're experiencing or as you in your research or as you talk to your colleagues, 
how would, could you give us just some big overviews of like why we're experiencing problems and for my listeners, like what things should they kind of like highlight as potential problems for the future? Well, we've always struggled in the U.S. to save. And yep. you know, some people are better savers than others, but that's been an ongoing issue that certainly hasn't been made any easier as wages and incomes have stagnated, costs are going up, student loans and so forth. And, and just trying to pay for your own kids' college and everything, it's becoming harder to save for retirement. So savings are down. And then also we've had this low interest rate environment for such a long time. And that also reduces kind of the potential for investment earnings. Uh, if you, people could, could get like an eight, 10, 12% type return that was possible at some points in the past, that definitely makes it a lot easier than, especially with the global pandemic right now and, and the 10 year treasury yield down at about 0.7%, the 30 year treasury yields down at about 1.4%. Interest rates are just so extremely low right now. You can't even keep pace with inflation. We have TIPS, the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, and the entire yield curve for that is negative. So that, that's just a real interest rate and you get inflation on top of that. But right now, if I want to put inflation adjusted spending protection for, for 10 years with a 10 year TIPS, I'm gonna trail inflation by 1%. Yeah. And that's just unheard of. And that just makes it all the more expensive to be able to fund a retirement goal. So in, in other words, number one, we, we struggle saving as a country. So people are not, let's just say the average person's not ahead entering retirement. And then in, in back in the good old days, which I, I can't vouch for, but um, you could have, you know, seven, 8% interest on pretty safe assets. Whereas now, um, the interest rates are incredibly low. And so a lot of people are throwing out this term, the 4% rule. Now, <laughs> this is how I've heard it explained. And I want to I wanna get it from the expert himself. But if you had a million dollars in a portfolio, the 4% rule would say that you could safely save or safely take out income of $40,000 a year and, and have a good chance of having some kind of assets over the next 30 years. Is, is that, is that true? Or is, is there something with inflation that's adjusted to that? Mm -hmm. Like, can you explain the 4% rule? And, and then it's, I've also read in your research that the 4% rule might be too aggressive. And so I just want to get, get it right from, from, from your mouth, mm -hmm. how we can understand a safe withdrawal rate. Yeah. So you, you basically explained it right. It is, there is inflation adjustments built into that. So you take out the $40,000 from a million dollars in the first year, and then in each subsequent year, you can increase the spending by what the consumer price index did the year before. And it was based on a 30 year time horizon. So in all the different 30 year periods we had in, in the US historical data, if you had a, and another thing about it is it assumes you have 50 to 75% stocks in retirement. So it needs an aggressive asset allocation. But if you did that, you could have expected your money to last for at least 30 years. And that's how long it lasted in the worst case scenario. In any other retirement year, you could have still had money left after 30 years using that 4% rule. And so just to clarify, so in year two, if, if the, you know, the index, you know, the, the inflationary index went up 2%, your 40,000 would be 40,000 plus 2%. Mm -hmm. additionally to that. Yeah, so um, okay. 4,800. Okay. And two. then there's, and, and so in your research was 4%, like, because I know that you've also, you've sort of bumped that down in a traditional, typical portfolio to, to less than 4%. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason for that is the 4% rule, it was, well, Bill Bengen, who's a financial advisor, he's retired now, but he, was he was actually correcting a big problem. He was noting that people would say, well, the stock market's earned 7% after inflation. So let's just plug 7% in a spreadsheet. And then it looks like every year my portfolio grows 7%. I can take 7% out. It's a safe withdrawal rate. I'll never dip into my principal or anything. And he just recognized that was ridiculous. Yeah. So he, the way he started to explore that was he, he got a hold of US historical data he had it back to 1926. And, and so he said, well, what if I got the market returns that we actually experienced from 1926 to 1955? And then from 1927 through 1956 and, and so on and so on. 
how much could I have spent if I had retired at the start of each of those periods and got the market returns for the next 30 years? And that worst case happened if I had got in the market returns from 1966 to 1995. That's when I could have just spent 4% with a portfolio of about 50 to 75% stocks. And so that, I mean, the issue is we're now really in uncharted waters because interest rates matter, stock market valuations matter. And in the historical data, we never saw conditions like what we have today. In 1941, the 10 year treasury yield dropped slightly below 2%. And that was the lowest interest rates had ever gotten. Today, the 10-year treasury yield is at 0.7%. And that just means lower returns from bonds in the future. Yep. The stock market valuations are also high, as high as they ever were in that historical data where we talk about, well, the 4% rule worked based on the 30 years of history there. So we now have the high valuations. And this is more controversial. But the idea is when valuations are higher, it suggests lower stock returns in the future and we have low interest rates at the same time. Those never happened at the same time before. Low interest rates, not controversial. It means lower bond returns in the future. And so it just puts that 4% rule, even though it worked in the worst case scenario from US history, it's under a lot more pressure today than it ever was in the past. And that was also what started me down this whole track was just that international experience of the 4% rule that with a 50-50 allocation around the world, it worked about two thirds of the time rather than 100% of the time. And so I, I just think it's under a lot more strain than people tend to believe just based on that the idea is, well, it always worked in US history, so it should be fine in the future. But I, I think there's more to the story than that. Yeah, and 100%. I mean, history, history can tell us a lot, but, but we also are, and you, you mentioned two things, interest rates being super low. You also touched on stock prices and at the time of this recording like i don't personally fully understand it i i haven't really talked to anyone that does but like i want to know number one i i think sometimes in in our world we're always taught that the market just always goes up okay and and i think there's i think history has showed like the market has gone up but i look at right now and i look at where our economy's at and i look at the housing market just booming and i look at the market being high but then i look at like the amount of people that are out of work and the amount of uncertainty. And, I, and I, I wonder, it's like, can we keep this up for the next hundred years? And, and again, I'm not an expert. I'm asking you this. It's just like, it's hard for me to imagine plugging in the 8% or the, the S&P mm -hmm. does 10%. It's just like, I, I wonder if that's going to be malpractice in the future of just like making that assumption and putting that into a financial plan. Right. And like, I don't like predicting what the markets are going to do. And I know that's not what you're asking either, but it's just, no, to be, con to develop a conservative retirement plan today, you do want to use a more conservative return assumption just because of all these issues. You don't want to assume that the stock market's going to average, like I hear 12% thrown out sometimes, which is a misunderstanding of the historical data, but even there's one way to see in the historical data that it was a 12% average return. But it's really difficult to think that something like that can continue from this point forward. And so if you're retiring today, it just makes sense to, to build in a more conservative projection for your retirement plan and to assume market returns will be less than they were historically, at least on average. I, I know, and I don't want to put you in a position to predict, but in, in your model, what kind of what kind of rate of return are you, are you thinking for equities or are you just, is that just uncertain? Like is 6% pretty standard, 7% or like, what, what do you see in the future? Or is that something that's just impossible to answer? So the way I'm, I'm most comfortable doing it is uh, look at where interest rates are as the starting point and then add in, there's this idea of the risk premium that historically stocks outperform bonds. And so historically, uh, the the S&P 500 has outperformed uh, government bonds by about 6% a year. And so I add that, I mean, you might make that 6% smaller because stock market valuations are high, but I tend to just use that 6% okay. number on top of where interest rates are and where interest rates are right now. Well, in the ballpark of a half a percent to one and a half percent. So you could say somewhere in the ballpark of six, seven, six to seven 
even seven and a half percent average returns for stocks in the future. Okay. And that's not necessarily what, if you're going to build a spreadsheet to look at your financial plan, you don't assume the average. That's more like if you were going to run a, one of these simulations where you look for a high probability of success. Exactly. And, and also what you're saying is it's, it's impossible to know. I, I've, I've done a lot of research about the difference between actual rate of return and average. And this will be interesting because losses can affect your portfolio much <laughs> greater than gains, especially when you're taking income out. And I think that's the one thing that you've really highlighted. And, and so essentially that when we're saving or investing for the future, there's dollar cost averaging. So even like when this, when the market crashed or whatever, you could think about that as an opportunity to put more money in. But when you're taking money out, um, sequence risk loss is kind of like that, that amazing thing that helps you going up the mountain uh, could ultimately hurt you going down. Can, can I hear your definition of sequence risk loss? And then what I want to do is talk about the different ways that you're looking from a research perspective. Uh, and, and, and I know that you look at a lot of typical financial planning, how we can maximize that and get better as it relates to helping people get more money and, and, and have more certainty as it relates to the unknown retirement world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the sequence of returns risk, it's something that's going to amplify investment volatility. And it's just this idea that if I'm spending from my assets and, and the market is down, I'm going to have to sell some principal to meet my spending goal or sell off more shares to, to meet my spending goal. And then that money is now gone. So even if the overall market recovers at that point, my portfolio is not going to recover. And I'm sort of digging a hole for my portfolio where it may never get to recover like the overall market. And it, so it makes the market returns really in the first five or 10 years of retirement drive the full retirement outcome, even if you're talking about a 30 year long retirement. It doesn't matter what the markets are doing in years 20 to 30. It matters what the markets are doing in years zero to five or well, especially, but zero to 10. Once you get past around year 10 of retirement, the, the importance of the market returns is a lot lower. Uh, you can see that with like the 4% rule, because if anyone who's comfortable doing a little math about that. So if I am, have a million dollars and take out $40,000 a year after inflation for 30 years, the, the rate of return that makes that work is a 1.3% real return. But the markets averaged 4.2% compounding growth after inflation during that 30 year period. And even the, the simple average 4.7% after inflation but when you account for that volatility, 4.2% after inflation. So if I had just put a dollar in the market in 1966 and let it grow for 30 years, it would have grown at 4.2% real. But if I retired in 1966 and I started spending from my assets, I only got to experience a 1.3% real return. And that's because I, I'm taking distributions uh, in that historical period after 1982, markets do great, and that pulls up the average, but it's too late for the retiree who has been spending since 1966. Their portfolio was too decimated by 1982 that they don't enjoy that market recovery. Their retirement, they, they got a much worse outcome than the market returns would have implied over their retirement period. And, and that, that's what sequence of returns risk does. It makes you more vulnerable to market volatility. And if that did not make sense, go back and listen, listen to that answer again, because that quite frankly was one of the best, you know, one minute spiel on sequence risk loss. And just, and just, you, you went over just over a period of time that you would think you would have, you could, you, you could make the assumption that, I, oh, I could easily spend 4% and be ahead. Whereas that's not the reality because we're playing by different rules. So, so thank you so much for breaking that down. I, I uh, really, really appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I want to go into is what are some of the solutions that, cause you, you dived in, you saw the problem and then I, I'm sure you were pretty, like you were pretty open to ideas when you first got into the biz, the, the, the research, did you have, have you changed any of your opinions about how money works? Number one, and what are some solutions that you see if you're nearing retirement or if you're someone even like my, my age, like wanting to do the very best thing? Like what are, what are some of the things that you see that have helped people maximize um, their retirement or what, what harsh truth that you need to hear when you're nearing retirement 
Um, and I know some of this stuff can be controversial. I don't think it will be with my audience, um, but I know when some people hear some of the things that you're going to say, they're going to be like, you know, <laughs> it, that's crazy. Like it, yeah, and I've heard, I actually was listening to an interview that you gave that the, the, the person was kind of arguing with you a little bit because they just couldn't believe some of the, the things that you were saying as it relates to alternative ways to think about your retirement income. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, the, I mean, back to my background with all that, I was really just somebody who was reading books about investing just for my own personal interests. So reading things like a random walk down Wall Street and, and just getting the idea that, you know, the way to approach things is you build a diversified investment portfolio. And so I was pretty comfortable with that, that that's how you approach financial planning. And then it just as that, that was on the side. But then as I started to become concerned with how that investment world was approaching retirement income with things like the 4% rule of thumb and so forth, and how those investment approaches, it, it's really the inefficiency of the investment approach, because you're, you have to self-manage all your risk. You have to be worried you might live a very long time. And you have to worry you might get bad market returns. I mean, that's the whole logic of the 4% rule. 30 years was a lot longer than life expectancy. Now, 30 years for a 65-year-old today may not be so conservative anymore. But at least in 1994, the idea was if I plan to live to age 95, it's really unlikely I'll live longer than that. And I'm going to plan for the worst case 30-year period in U.S. history. And so the way I'm managing these risks is I just behave like I'm going to be in this worst case scenario. So I spend less, but then I always have this uncertainty that, well, there could be a new worst case scenario. It's like what they say with investments, past performance doesn't guarantee or predict future performance. There could be a new worst case scenario at some point. And then I'm overspending, but I never know that. Most of the time I'm underspending, but I might always have this fear that I'm overspending. And it's just not a very efficient way to approach retirement. And so then that's when I started to understand insurance as a potential tool and the power of risk pooling, whether that's through an annuity initially or later than looking at it from the perspective of life insurance. The, the simple idea of an income annuity is just you have this collection of people. Nobody knows how long they're going to live. And then as well, the insurance company will take those premiums and invest in a high quality, basically a bond portfolio could be a little bit of diversification, but a long-term, very diversified, higher yielding bond portfolio than most households could put together. And then everyone in that risk pool gets to spend as though they'll live to their life expectancies, which I mean, to simplify, it would be perhaps in the neighborhood of age 85 and also spend like they're going to get an average bond-like return on their assets versus in that self-insurance or self-funding mode. Well, what if I do live to age 95 or beyond? And, and as soon as you start, even if you're using stocks and you have this belief that stocks will outperform bonds, when you're also trying to have a high chance for success, like, like a lot of these financial plans, if you're targeting a 90% chance for success, the software never reports. There's a, the return that works with that, but you can reverse engineer that and you might find it's actually lower than if you were just assuming a, a bond return yep. because of the risk of the stock market. And so by pooling that risk, being able to spend like you live to an average life expectancy and get average bond returns, the, what it means is the payout rate on the annuity is going to be higher than what I view as the safe withdrawal rate from an investment portfolio. And then that means I can retire with less assets through the annuity because I don't have to self-manage so much risk. I can pull that risk with others. And so then partial annuity integrated strategies, strategies that include insurance with investments you more efficiently earmark less assets with the insurance to meet the spending goals. And then you use the investments on the side to focus more on stocks and the growth potential of the stock market and, and the upside potential that way. And when you bring those two together, you can lay a more efficient or a, a better foundation for meeting retirement spending goals and preserving assets for legacy or for, for meeting other types of unexpected expenses and so forth. So, so I want to I want to break that down a little bit more. Um, a lot of times, annuities get a bad rap, and probably one of the biggest things that people will say is, you know, if something happens to you and and you die prematurely, 
uh, there's a world where you don't get any of that money back or your kids don't get that money back. And so I think some people call it the covered asset strategy or pension optimization. There's a lot of different names for it, but I've seen where people, you know, have their, their money growing in, in 401k, in the market, whatever, and they're getting to a certain place, get a life insurance policy as well, and then are able to, when they hit retirement, say, okay, my, my stocks and bonds, whenever they did its thing, but knowing that going down the mountain, there's just a lot more volatility. And so instead of self-insuring, they put their money into an annuity, but their life insurance death benefit covered their assets. So if something does happen to them prematurely, that their, their legacy, their estate wouldn't get affected. But as a result, they're getting to spend more money now. And, and that's just an example of an efficient way to get more money while still um, you know, saving your assets. Is that an example of like some, some of the strategies that you looked at as it relates to like how one could use life insurance and an annuity for its purpose? Yeah. Yeah. So then after I started to understand the value of annuities, I was talking to the folks at Wealth Building Cornerstones who were telling me, well, you should look at life insurance and all this as well. And, and that covered asset strategy. Yeah, the, the, I was showing that the math just works out. The, the most efficient retirement income is you use a life only income annuity, which has that full risk you just mentioned that if you only live one month after buying it, you you kind of paid all that premium and you didn't get much in return. Um, and so people are worried about that. That is the most efficient strategy just because by giving the most mortality credits to the risk pool, by offering that most risk to yourself to the risk pool, you get the most benefit in return. That You'll have a higher payout rate. If you live longer, you'll, you'll get a better outcome with that. But people are very worried about life-only income annuities. And so then the discussion becomes, well, what if you build life insurance into the annuity? Like what if you add cash refunds or what if you use joint life instead of single life to cover two people and so forth? Or, and then that's where, or another way, instead of trying to build the life insurance into the annuity, what if you covered that asset with permanent life insurance? And just to keep numbers simple, like what if I got to retirement with a million dollars of a death benefit and a life insurance policy then I may feel comfortable buying a single life, life only income annuity for up to that million dollars amount. Because I know that in the event something happens, I'll have the life insurance replace that asset. And that's where for somebody who doesn't live very long, the annuity ends up giving you like a bad return on your money, so to speak. But life insurance gives you a, a higher return on your money if you don't live very long. It's kind of you get a better, and so they balance each other out. And then if right. you end up living a very long time, then the life insurance, it's more like a bond yield. Uh, but the annuity offers a much higher benefit at that point. And so the two can balance each other out and you can get a better overall outcome for your retirement when integrating the, the life insurance, the annuity and the investments together, a, a better way to lay that foundation to support spending and legacy at the same time. Yeah, so I, I was testing that out and it worked. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. And I, I think a lot of times, um, I, at least I explain life insurance as an and asset. And I think a lot of times, especially in the space that I'm in, a lot of people like to look at the living benefits, look at all the, you know, they, they just talk about the cash value and all the, the things that happen in there. And we sometimes forget the death benefit. That death benefit, well, it might not matter to you because you'll, you'll be dead. So it's like you're not going to necessarily benefit from it. You can benefit from it by unlocking other assets. And this is an example of how um, you just shared in a very safe, should I say guaranteed way to increase your money without having a, lo a lot of quote unquote risk. Now, I know you also talk a lot about, about a volatility buffer. And, mm -hmm. I, and I know there's, there's really three areas that I've seen in your research that you can create a volatility buffer. So can you, number one, explain that strategy, the pros and cons versus just the covered annuity strategy versus the using it with, you know, the volatility buffer and explain what that is. And I don't know if you wanted to make any comment on the covered asset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So well, at the end of the day, there's really these four techniques for managing sequence risk and you can spend less, which is the 4% the rule concept. No guarantee, but just how low does your spending need to go so that you're comfortable? 
you can be flexible with your spending. If you can just cut your spending after market downturns, that also helps. You can manage volatility more efficiently, and that's where things like annuities can play a role. And then what, what you said, the volatility buffer or the buffer asset, that's the fourth approach. And that's you have some asset outside your portfolio, not correlated with your portfolio that can be a temporary resource for spending so that after a market downturn, if my portfolio looks to be in trouble and I'd rather not have to spend from it, I, I can skip spending from it. I can just temporarily spend from my buffer asset or my volatility buffer instead. And that can help manage the sequence risk because I'm not selling at a loss from my portfolio and I'm giving my portfolio more chance to recover. And so, you know, like you said, there, there's three buffer assets that get discussed. The original one was just cash. You have this big pile of cash sitting on the sidelines. And that sort of really has fallen out of favor. The, actually, a lot of this was happening at the same time, but we had an article in the Journal of Financial Planning just showing how the drag of not getting any returns on your cash made it end up looking worse than if you just did the total returns strategy without a cash buffer. So cash was the first option, but not so popular. Then the other two are the cash value of whole life insurance and, and also the growing line of credit on a reverse mortgage. These are both assets that are contractually protected not to decline in value and that can allow for policy loans or well, in the life insurance, a policy loan in the reverse mortgage is just a loan where you draw from these assets. It now has a loan balance that will accumulate interest. But by helping to avoid selling from your portfolio, you're laying the foundation for your portfolio to recover better. And then what the, the simulations that I do show is the gains to the portfolio are greater than the costs of using the buffer asset. So the, the cost of having the life insurance of, and of borrowing from the policy, well, you can pay that off and still have something left over because you've helped to manage that sequence of your returns risk for your portfolio. Uh, when it comes to when it comes to the cash value strategy, how much how much buffer how many years of quote unquote income do you recommend having a buffer? And, and so I, that's my question number one. And then the part two to that question is if you have a proper buffer strategy, the the four percent rule, what does that increase to in in your research? Mm -hmm. So it goes up, and the. I guess if you could really design things perfectly, you'd have about as much cash value as you had investment portfolio. In practice, that's really hard to do. And kind of another various aspects of research I've done, it's very hard to know the balance on your investment portfolio in the future because there is sequence of returns risk pre-retirement as well. It's just not as much. But as I get closer to retirement, the market returns impact more of my contributions into my account, more of my wealth. There's kind of this, the logic of saving is if I believe I'll get 7% returns on average, every year my portfolio, I'm sorry, every 10 years, my portfolio doubles. Yep. So 10 years before retirement, I'm still halfway to the goal and I'm really dependent on what happens in those 10 years and so forth. So it's very hard in practice to calibrate these things. So that's then not really how I'm thinking about it as much. I'm thinking just more in terms of people need life insurance pre-retirement. And so trying to figure out what, what's a good balance there, including some term insurance as well when you're younger, but then what's a good balance of permanent life insurance to have. And there are diminishing returns from having the buffer, but I think if you have say three to five years worth of spending in your buffer, and it's important to remember these are proceeds from a loan, so it's not taxable income. So like if I had to take out, if I had an IRA and I have life insurance, yeah. when I'm taking from the IRA, I have to pay taxes on that money. So I can take out less from the life insurance to cover the same spending after tax since I, I don't have to pay taxes on that. But if you could have three to five years, that, that's going to go a long way towards helping you. And it will increase the withdrawal rate. Now, it's hard to give a precise amount. I, I mean, I have the simulations on it yeah. and I'm trying to remember like even on my website, I show if you had five years of buffer asset, how that would increase the withdrawal rate compared to if you didn't have any buffer asset. 
And I mean, I'm thinking it depends. There's also different cases as well, yeah. but <laughs> just for example, and hypothetical numbers, if I'm saying that the safe withdrawal rate is 3% without a buffer, it could be three and a half, 3.6, 3.7% in that ballpark. If you had five years of a buffer yeah. asset on the sides and yeah. that, that percentage applies just to the investments, not to the investments plus the buffer asset. Okay. Very cool. So um, and I've also seen, and I can't recall it from the top of my head, but when you have a buffer, how that does have a tremendous impact to, to the bottom line and the cash flow. Um, and so that's, that's incredible. Um, can we talk about reverse mortgages for a second? Because when I, when I think of a reverse mortgage, I almost think about you annuitizing your home. And obviously, a reverse mortgage and life insurance go well together because then, you know, if something does happen to you, you have an option to either keep the house or leave the house. So I've heard that strategy. But when you talk about it as a buffer asset, I guess I don't, I, I would almost think a HELOC could be a buffer. But the problem with the HELOC is it could, it could go away. Mm -hmm. um, and so reverse mortgage, I guess, I, explain to me how that is a buffer asset, because I almost, I would almost put that into an, the annuity category. Yeah, so, so a he, traditional home equity line of credit, they can be frozen and canceled. And that's what happened right now in the global pandemic. So you can't really use it as a buffer asset because it may not be there when you need it. <laughs> that kind of disqualifies it. Otherwise, if it was protected, you could call that a buffer asset too. It, just, it may also force repayment sooner than you had wanted as well, which could yeah. be another downside. But the reverse mortgage line of credit if you have a variable rate home equity conversion mortgage, it has this growing line of credit that grows at the same rate that any sort of loan balance that you had would be growing. And so, and it can't be frozen or canceled. So that's why it has these properties of being, you know, a volatility buffer. It's not correlated with your portfolio. It can provide that spending resource for you when you need it. Yeah. Uh, you can't, I mean, when you talk about annuitizing the home, there is the 10 year payment option, which does that. And that works fine as well. It's, I don't think it's as popular in practice, kind of the, what we hear about the, the most popular use for a reverse mortgage is if you carry a traditional mortgage in retirement and you have these big fixed mortgage expenses, you take those out of the picture by refinancing your mortgage into a reverse mortgage. And that helps manage sequence risk because you yep. now don't have this bigger expense in the early retirement years when you're more vulnerable. Yep. And yep. then the other one, most of the, the research, kind of the Journal of Financial Planning had a whole series of articles. That was all about effectively the volatility buffer, the same way the life insurance world talks about cash value for whole life insurance. On the, in the reverse mortgage world, they had independently discovered the same concept <laughs> and, and said, oh, this growing line of credit on the reverse mortgage can be used as a volatility buffer. They didn't know about the, the life insurance work that had been done in that area, but it, it's the same concept applied with a reverse mortgage instead of life insurance. Uh, one, of the, one of the growing concerns that a lot of our, my listeners have is, is where taxes are going to be 15, 20, 30 years. I mean, our our country is spending money like it's going out of style. Do you, do you have any comment on, on that? Or is that in your research? Like, do you look at like, are taxes going to stay the same, go down, go up? Or is it just, again, is that just a, is, is, does that affect retirement? Because I feel like it does, depending mm -hmm. on where your assets are. Uh, so I have been doing more research on just how to be more efficient with taxes and how being efficient with taxes can extend the longevity of your retirement plan by six, seven years in, in some cases. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, I don't do research about, it certainly seems like at some point taxes will be higher, but I don't have any crystal ball about when that may happen or, or what that may be. But yeah, I think it's at least reasonable for people to expect higher tax rates in the future. And so that's where you can position yourself especially if you're going to, I, I'm also a big advocate of delaying social security benefits. So if you're retired in your 60s and you're delaying social security to 70, you might have this great window of opportunity to do all these strategic Roth conversions and things to help better set you up. Because another interesting thing about taxes and retirement, it's called the social security tax torpedo. 
where if you have a dollar of addition, like I take another dollar out of my IRA, yeah. that may trigger taxes on another 85 cents of social security. Yeah. And so I thought I was in the 22% tax bracket, but I'm actually in the 40.7% tax bracket when I'm just getting another dollar out of my IRA. So planning ahead for managing that and, and managing Medicare premiums and so forth, doing strategic Roth conversions. And then that of course can be a, another benefit of life insurance that if you've already filled your tax advantaged, your, like 401ks and so forth, life insurance can provide the tax deferral. And, and then the, the tax when structured properly, it's an important caveat, but tax-free distributions. Right through either policy loans, a return of basis, and also the, the death benefit, of course, is not, uh, it doesn't go into income taxes. Right, right. And, and that's, that's one of those things that I think is, I think people are starting to talk about it, but it's another potentially biggest variable. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but it could be potentially a huge variable when you talk about the spending power of your money. And if taxes, you know, go up, you still, it's, it, you either have to reduce your lifestyle or take out more, which I would, I would assume would affect uh, the retirement plan. Um, I could talk to you for a while. I know that I, I love geeking out about, uh, about these kind of things. Um, is there anything, any message that you've been sharing with people? Like, I know this is uncommon, but do you just see that people have to work longer? Like, I, I know a lot of people that I'm, I'm working with, even the high income earners, the the their savings are just not going to be sustain them retiring early. What is your thoughts on that? I also know that there's a fire movement. They have this idea that they're going to retire at 35 years old and live off of dividends. Can you touch on those two things? And then I also just want to like, I want to just give you the ability to share anything else in your research. I know my my listeners are heavily researchers and are going to geek out over your books and your website. And, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I, I'm excited to share this message with as many people as possible. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I, I don't want to say that anyone has to like clearly work longer, but I would say working longer is a really powerful way to get a retirement plan on track. More years of savings, longer, a longer period for your savings to grow and hopefully, hopefully grow and <laughs> get to be larger through gains. Uh, a shorter subsequent retirement period, and also helping with the delaying social security, which has a huge impact as well. So for people who are falling short, working longer is a very powerful way to get the retirement plan back on track. Um, also, I, yeah, I'm interested in that, the, the FIRE community, financial independence, retire early. I know a lot of them believe in the 4% rule, and that always makes me nervous, because even for, for true advocates of the 4% rule, it was never meant to apply to early retirees. It, it's specifically calibrated for 30 years. And if I'm retiring at 35 or 40, I may live for another 60 years. So there is, even in the historical data, even for someone who, like, I'm nervous about the 4% rule, but even if I fully believe in the 4% rule, it never was meant to apply to an early retiree. Right. And, and so for them, being flexible with spending having the ability to do some sort of part-time work. Whenever you can, it's another way to manage that sequence of returns risk. Like if yeah. I have a way to generate some income so that I don't have to sell from my portfolio at certain points. Of course, it could be hard to generate income when the stock market's crashing, but, uh, but at least if I had the capacity to do that, that, that is a way to help manage that risk as well. So that, that's just, you've got to be flexible if you're going down that path. And the 4% rule is never meant to, you can ask Bill Bengen that and it was never meant to apply to a 35-year-old. Yeah. We're, we're having the conversation, is the 4% rule, will it work over 30 years? Because you could have no money after then. But now when you add another 30 years, it's like, I, I hope you have, I hope you have a lot of peace because uh, <laughs> that might be used up sometime in the next 60 years. Um, is there any, anything else? I know you do a ton of research. Um, and again, I, I love interviewing people like yourself because um, I just, it's just such an honor to have you on. Is there anything else in your research uh, that you'd love to share? Uh, well, lately I've been focusing more on writing books and getting books out. So I'm going to have hopefully another book next year, but I do have three books already. So <laughs> anyone interested in, in learning more about any of that, my website's retirementresearcher.com. 
And then the book where I talk more about this integrated insurance and investments, I call it Safety First Retirement Planning. So these, these books are all on Amazon, but Safety First Retirement Planning is about using insurance with investments. How much can I spend in retirement is, I kind of ca- put a caveat in that book, like if you don't believe in annuities, because a lot of people take that sort of approach, here's how you can manage retirement just with investments. Not as efficient with it as an integrated strategy, but here's kind of a book for people who are investments only. And then also the, the first book I wrote, a shorter book on, on reverse mortgages. And, and then and next I'm, year, I hope to have a book on just retirement income in general, touching upon everything, including social security, tax efficiency, Medicare, legacy planning, like one of those books that covers everything yep. <laughs> in one book. We'll, we'll have to have you on again next year to promote your book and get a okay, copy great. sold. Um, one, of the, one of the last questions I ask all, all of our guests is, it's called the legacy question. This is like, we have to take off our research hat and you know, go into the human element, but it's, it's if this was your last day on earth. So hopefully you did not do that single pay annuity kind of deal, okay? <laughs> uh, but if this was your last day on earth, and you were with the people that you love the most, out of all the things that you've learned, what would you pass on in that last conversation, assuming that you only had one conversation with the people that you love? Like, what, what kind of things have you learned in life that like, are really important to you that you'd want to pass on to the next generation? Well, that's a tough question, but I, I think ultimately always finding a balance between working hard, but also making sure you have that opportunity to enjoy things. And that's where, yes, at any point, it could be your last day. And so don't put off too much. And that's like when you ask the question about working longer, (laughs) it's not necessarily that you need to to work longer, but finding the right balance there. Maybe you can live on less there. You certainly can make do with social security and maybe a little bit of supplemental income and things. So just trying to find the right balance between working hard, but also getting the enjoyment as well out of life. I, I, I really appreciate that. And I also want to just say, if you're listening to this, like we have one life, make sure that you're like living it well. And if you're, if you're 35 years old and really hating your life or hating the, the work that you're in, um, consider making a a change <laughs> because um, it's, it's this whole idea of retirement is not always, um, is not always what it seems. And I've, I've just seen a lot of people like they're, it's kind of like the carrot and then they get there and they realize, wow, like I, it's, it's, this is like a fraction of what I would expect. And so I, I think knowing that and talking to people like you, it helps make my decisions um, just the way that I live my life today, just knowing that the future is uncertain. And, and so we want, we want to live well and love what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to the better wealth podcast. It would mean the world to me if you could hit subscribe, leave a review and share this with the people that you know and love.